Hi, this is Lisa Feely. Welcome to An Accountable Catholic. And we have a very treasured guest with us today. Uh, his time very valuable, and we're very uh, happy to have you, Father Jeffrey Kirby. So welcome, Father. Thank you. Good to be on the show. Well, we have a, a very big listening audience that are very interested in hearing from wonderful people like you. And I know that you just wrote a brand new book. So today, if we can, we'd love to talk about your book, um, yeah. kind of the inspiration behind the book and the connection between the cross and, and those of us, uh, those not those of us, those of us obviously that stay in with the church, but those people that have left the church. And, you know, I wrote a book, um, you might have heard that's what the shows our radio shows about an accountable catholic um and the book an accountable american and in that father we saw a huge drop in numbers of people who left our church right so um would love to hear your perspective so could you give our audience all of our listeners a little bit of background on you as well yes i'm the pastor uh, at our lady of grace parish in indiana south carolina and uh, before that i was a vocations director for the diocese of charleston and I have uh, some studies, doctoral work in uh, moral theology and um, papal missionary of mercy, which is great. So I always try to provide extra confessions and uh, fulfill that mandate. So, uh, so the amazing thing about being a priest or even just a Christian is we never know where the Lord's going to take us. And uh, our task is just keep saying yes, right? So, so uh, my priesthood is, is in all kinds of different directions, but uh, the foundation is, is my parish work, being a parish priest uh, here at Indian Land. Fantastic. Well, we're very excited to have you down here. But tell us a little bit about your new book, if you will, and what inspired you um, and the connection, I guess, between uh, the way of our cross and those that have left the church. Yeah, so we know that uh, the way in which the Lord Jesus reconciled us to the Father was, was precisely through the way of the cross. right? So, so uh, that devotion reflects uh, the very means of our salvation, how all of us were brought home. I uh, can see the face of our Father. So it's a it's a beautiful devotion in general, and especially, I think, one that's very pointed in terms of uh, a spiritual response to those who've left the faith. So, uh, so I wanted to use that devotion. And full disclosure, I have a strong personal devotion uh, to the Stations of the Cross as well. So, uh, so I've kind of matched. Like, uh, in fact, uh, friends and staff know if I have to make a, a hard decision or a difficult decision, uh, I always insist on walking the way of the cross first. Because, because it puts everything in, in perspective, you know. So, uh, so personal devotion, that theological reason, uh, I decided to use the Stations of the Cross uh, in terms of uh, spiritual intercession or supplication for those who've left the faith. And, and why I felt like that needed to be responded to was just, you know, we look at the church, and even before the pandemic, uh, for every one convert we got, we lost six. And oh. with the pandemic, it's worse. So uh, of all my... Uh, in my 14 years of priesthood, the one consistent pastoral uh, problem has been um, people who have grieved the loss of loved ones for the faith, and, and especially in terms of their eternal, uh, you know, uh, eternal salvation and so on. So, uh, so both pastorally and theologically, I just thought it was time to give a spiritual response to the spiritual problem. I love it. So I'm going to talk, obviously, firsthand and for many mothers and fathers that I have met all across the country when I was writing my book. Why do you think this is happening so drastically, Father? Because that it is very hard for many of us who have raised our children in the faith, right? And they've we've done everything we, were, we thought we're supposed to do as Catholic parents. And I don't think, I mean, it's a very stat, sad statement, but a very true one. I don't think I've met a set of parents in the last five years, Catholic parents or Christian parents at least, that raised their children in the faith all the way through, all the way through high school, and then they got to college, and after college, forget it. Uh, what is happening in your mind? I mean, what, what can we do? Yes, I, well, um, statistically, we know there are two things that parents can give their children that might lessen the likelihood that they would leave. Of course, we're all... We all have free will. And I saw a, a, a cartoon the other day, a political cartoon. It said, um, Christian parents pay $100,000 to Secular University to destroy 18 years of Christian formation. You know, so, uh, so sometimes it's, it's the colleges that young people are sent to. But, but two things that we can do in terms of, of the upbringing of the formation of young people uh, is one, to develop, help them develop a real personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's huge. I mean, I think it's like 80% difference in terms of those who might leave 
just because if that if they do or do not have that personal relationship. The second, and, and I think that it's it's a kind of forgotten reality, but the second point is to give them a stable Eucharistic community. Uh, what that means is to stay in one parish, right? We've gotten to a point where uh, a lot of our Catholics bounce. They go to this parish for one day, this weekend, then this weekend, then that weekend. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about the periodic vacation or you sure. know, a conflict that happens. And so the good thing, of course, is get to Mass. But, but when that's the pattern and the norm, well, right. what that says to young people is this is just a duty. Like this doesn't mean anything or our community life doesn't have anything to do with this as opposed to young people who are raised in a stable Eucharistic community. They know people, people know them, they feel connected, right? So right. on the big picture, two things we can do is help our young, help the young people to develop that personal relationship with Christ yeah. and to have that stable Eucharistic community. Like those are two big things. But of course, truth be told, Christian parents can do that and it does lessen the likelihood. But we know that a lot of people are leaving because I think a lot of it is the colleges that young people are sent to and the overall secularism that, pervades our entire culture. Uh, I tell people being a Christian today is like showing up at a large stadium right after the sports event, sport event has concluded and everyone is leaving the stadium, but you're trying to get in. And and that's the equivalent of what it's like trying to live as a Christian in a secular world. So we are constantly going against the grain, constantly having to be countercultural. And for a lot of our young people, they just say, thanks, but no thanks. They've checked out. It's very, it's, it's very hard. So hopefully we'll uh, get some ideas from you too on what else we can do as we, as we continue to try to help them at 24, 25, and 26. Yes. But um, how do you recommend we, we work with your book or use your book? Um, can you give us some thoughts, you know, as people acquire your book and try to learn from it? Yes, thank you for asking that question. Because, you know, whether it's my book or some other devotional, um, what I realized is that right now we're in a great position where, uh, we have a lot of catechetical responses to people who've left the church. We have a lot of pastoral responses, uh, and, and these are relatively new, and it's great. It's good to right. see that this has developed. But the one thing that I noticed uh, constantly is that there was no consistent spiritual response. Uh, and, and this is a spiritual problem first. Like yeah. People leave the faith because they don't believe in Jesus, or they don't think the Mass is important, or they don't understand what organized religion has to contribute in terms of their relationship with God. So it's a spiritual problem. And, and so while we need these other responses, catechetical and pastoral, uh, I think a spiritual response is needed for a spiritual problem. And I was just surprised, honestly, that I, there was nothing out there. So I decided to, again, use the Stations of the Cross because of that theology and to provide a spiritual response. So how it can be used, it could be done by individuals, it could be done by married couples, it could be done by small groups. Um, I received an email from one prayer group at a parish, and they're doing it once a month as as a, as a small prayer group. Uh, so it can be done all fourteen stations at once. It can be done one station every week. It can be done one station every first Friday if someone has that devotion, right? So it could be used as in diverse ways as someone would want. But ultimately, the the, the push is this is a spiritual response: is walking the way of the cross. Uh, carrying the cross, whatever faults we may have had, may, we may have done, or good things we failed to do in order to help someone. And then, of course, offering supplication uh, for the suffering. Because, you know, people forget that when people walk away from the church and from Christ, like, they lose the hope and the mercy, the, the, that constant second chance yep. we receive in Christ. They lose all that, right? And, and instead, what they are filled with is a lot of times hopelessness or, or lack of meaning. And, and that's really a hell on earth. I yeah, and I think the saddest part is, especially for the young that I see and talk to and meet, because I travel all the time all over the country, they don't see it that way at all. They're so blind, right? They just think, nope, we've got this. Um, and it's just sad. It's kind of watching a child want to run across the street without looking both ways and you can't control them. <laughs> it's like, yes. ah, yes. you know. Yes. I think that's the way a lot of us parents feel, you know, in the, in the occasion that we have this situation. So if you had one station, I guess you could pick, um, I'm trying to help our listeners pretend to have their, have your book in front of them. What's your personal favorite, uh, in the context of our loved ones having, um, left the faith, which one would it be? And can you yeah. take us through a little? Yes. I, I think, um, if I can maybe give you two. Oh, <laughs> no, I'd love that. 
Yeah, be so great. I think, um, our Lord meeting uh, Our Lady. So as Our Lady uh, spiritually shares uh, with him during the sufferings of, of his passion and, and that station where he meets his mother, uh, I think is very powerful where, as we mentioned earlier, so many parents uh, feel that kind of loss or desperation uh, because a loved one has left the faith or someone is, is suffering and, and does not know uh, the meaning that can be given to their suffering uh, in Christ. So there, there's that one for multiple reasons. And then, of course, uh, Jesus meeting the uh, wailing women. Uh, so how many family members have, have wailed because of the loss of their loved ones to the faith, right? So, so that one in particular kind of stands out. And, and I've always just enjoyed that where the Lord's like, don't cry for me, cry for your children. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, just, uh, you know, don't worry about me um, and, and so on. So I think those two, uh, especially in this context, uh, uh, stand out. And, and just to, to describe, you know, the setup of each station is, is the traditional setup. So there's a traditional start. There's a first prayer that in many respects is about us. Like, you know, what did we do or not do? Uh, that may have contributed to someone leaving. And I do think there has to be an examination of conscience sometimes, right? Because uh, sometimes there is fault to be to be carried, right? Yeah. Uh, but then the second prayer is the real supplication for the loved one. And of course, each part of the prayer takes on the station or the encounter of the station uh, to help develop that. So, so I would say the, yeah. the the Lord meeting Our Lady and then the Wailing Women stand out right now. But of course, all fourteen depending on the week or what's happening, any one of the 14 stand out. Fantastic. Well, and I will admit, I have not had a chance to get your book and read it yet, but if, if there were someone out there saying, um, gee, I'd love to just pick it up, read it. Do we, is that something we can do kind of in our house initially to our home, you know, get obviously our rosary or our, our crucifix out and um, try to bring up the stations and, I mean, how, how would you explain that? Is that possible? And yeah. is there a target audience where you're really trying to help more the youth, parents help their youth? I mean, or is this for good youth groups and churches? What's your thought? Yeah, so I, I think it, it can be done uh, at home. Uh, the, 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 you know, the devotional has each of the stations, so the pictures okay. provided. Uh, okay. Of course, the pictures are, aren't required. Uh, it could be done by someone just sitting in a chair in their living room or sitting out back, or okay. uh, it can certainly be done very simply. Um, and in terms of uh, uh, groups, it can be done. I, I will say the prayers are a little bit longer than mm -hmm. what we might be accustomed to in the traditional stations. Uh, okay. So in terms of like large groups, uh, well, it won't be, it, it's not impossible. It might just be a little slower than what uh, we're used to. But, uh, but no, I would love to see that. I, and, and in terms of target audience, like anyone who has a loved one. So I, it was purposely written broadly. So it can be a spouse. It can be a child, a grandchild, a niece or nephew. It can be a beloved mentor, it can be, you know, a, a respected friend, anyone who has left the faith, um, that you'll find that this way of the cross uh, is for them. So, and again, the language was purposely chosen in such a way where uh, it doesn't cater to one group, but can be used by any, any relationship that's important to the person. Terrific. Well, we, if you don't mind, I forgot to tell you at the beginning, we'll take a little bit of a break here in between, um, where we can actually show your book and everything as well. So, um, and how to find it. And then we'll come right back after the break. So we'll take about a 30 second break here, Father, and we'll come right back. Carolina Catholic Radio is excited to announce an alliance with Lisa Feely, author of An Accountable American. Her new book offers a blueprint to every person who wants to embrace how to be accountable. Learn how positively to impact your life and the lives of anyone around you. 50% of the book profits will be donated to a local 501c3 Catholic charity, including Carolina Catholic Radio and those affiliated with us. 2020 was a tough year for many people. Consider donating to charity by buying a copy of An Accountable American, just $20 on our website. Achieving accountability is a great way to start the new year. If you want to learn how to achieve enlightenment, peace, and prosperity, this is a great start. Now back to An Accountable Catholic Radio Show. 
Hi, Lisa Feely here again with an accountable Catholic and Father Kirby with me to continue now after our break and wonderful um, information we're receiving so far. Father, we can't, I think so many of us can't wait to get your book. And the last few questions we have here as we wrap up in the next 10 or so minutes is what advice um, can you offer us on how we reach out to loved ones who have left the church? And again, whether they're a spouse, I mean, I think there's different situations, right? Whether they're son, whether they're daughter, whether they're in high school, and whether you're, you're, you know, a young adult now, um, like you said, it's so challenging. So any advice that you have for us? Yes. I think the, the first thing is, is to ask the questions that oftentimes we think are assumed and, and we may have even thought that we asked the question, uh, but it's amazing how oftentimes in, in those type of relationships, again, whether it's with a spouse, an adult child, or whoever, you know, whomever it might be. Um, but just ask the hard questions, like, for example, hey, um, so why have you stopped going to mass? <laughs> you know, it's amazing how many people don't ask the question or, or ask it in you know, the wrong context. So they wait till there's a fight or they wait till there's some other source of frustrations. And by the way, you know, why don't you, why don't, why don't you go to mass? And so, which really isn't a question. Uh, and, and obviously a person can't open up, but, but to really just sit down in, in the best context that, that a person can and just say, why, why don't you stop going to mass? And don't be surprised if the person says, I don't know. Right. So the number one reason why we see that people leave the church is indifference. Right? They really just come to the point where they begin to believe that the church contributes nothing to their life and simply just adds more stuff or difficulty to their life. So they just stop, right? And a lot of times we know uh, from Pew Research, it takes the average Catholic about two years before they finally leave. So they've kind of been flirting with this, right? It starts where they just maybe miss some holy days, say not going to confession as often, and then they miss a few Sundays. And then, you know, there's good reason, they think, because, you know, vacation or they're on a cruise that doesn't have a chaplain or, you know, so, but this is how it starts. And then, of course, usually after about the two years, there's some spark, right? This is why we hear people say, I left because a priest yelled at me or the sister was mean to me or the DRE was a real jerk or something, right? right? There's something that happens that then in their mind is a straw that broke the camel's back, right? Now, that's good for us to know because when people tell these stories, right. they're usually not exactly what the reality might be different than their narrative, right? right. Because they're bringing sometimes up to two years of, you know, spiritual disassociation with the church. And, and then suddenly this happens, right? So oftentimes when we ask them, why don't you leave the church? They might not know. It just, it didn't seem important anymore. It didn't help me and so on, right? right? And when we hear that, we have to be ready then to give some type of answer, right? And, and oftentimes a testimonial is the, is the least uh, confrontational. So I, I, I can understand how, you know, you can struggle with that. And I'd like to share with you what being a Catholic or going to Mass has meant to me, right? Or to recount the, account, the stories or the testimonies of others, right? But I think that sincere, honest conversation and, and to just remind ourselves, we don't have to defend the Lord Jesus in that moment. We don't have to defend right. the church. We don't have to defend the mass. Uh, if we're going to ask our loved one to really open up and share something that, that might be very difficult for them, like they might be shocked. I never thought I'd be that Catholic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and yet here I am. Right? I, I, you, know, you can imagine the, the older person who's a spouse who raised their children Catholic, and then they themselves are the lost and would never have imagined and, and aren't even sure themselves why don't I go to mass anymore, right? So I think that sincere conversation goes a long way. Uh, that's one part. That's more in the pastoral. The other, I think, is catechetical. Like, be good disciples. Like, you know, we can't be terrible disciples and then think that somehow our witness is going to be enough or our argument for duty or this is just something you're supposed to do is sufficient. Uh, those arguments are gone, right? So wait, the, the do as I say, not as I do doesn't fit right. here, huh? I know, right, right, right. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and sometimes it might not even be like sinful things. It's just you can't always look miserable and then tell someone that being a Christian gives you joy. Right. <laughs> right. Nope. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. So uh, I love Teresa of Avila. She said, uh, Lord, save me from sour face saints. Right. So sometimes uh -huh. a smile goes a long way. So I think that's the, the catechetical and, and living our own discipleship and knowing our faith, because sometimes people might respond like, 
They say, well, I don't understand the church's view on sexual matters or yep. on this issue. So that that's issue. where I was going to go, not to get, you know, into some hardcore stuff, but I'm imagining, Father, that you're running into lots of parents and lots of young people that I think are more willing today. I mean, you and I beforehand were talking about the priests that I grew up and stuff with, and I was very fortunate, very blessed, but I could never, and I'll be honest, very honest with you, obviously, I could never imagine going up to any of my priests that I grew up with and saying, hey, Father, I think your church stinks because <laughs> this is going on and this is going on. And, you know, you think that's something I ought to be a part of when you have, you know, all the sexual harassment issues and my good friends that are that are gay, you're telling them they're horrible. So what's wrong with you? Because right. that's not what a loving God would do. And that's what I'm hearing. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I would never have had those conversations but these younger i'm gonna say younger 17 to 30 year olds are having those conversations they're very open to telling you exactly what they think yes exactly and and i think having the answer ready for those because uh, i think one of the greatest cultural challenges right now uh is uh lgbtq plus and all that goes with that the sexual thank you yeah gender equality arguments uh, yes. uh even when just personal identity or, or god yes. is creator right so so they have an answer ready for those. And, and I will say that uh, in the fall, um, my background is small theology. There's a book coming out where I address nine popular issues, oh, very okay. practical talking points. We need um, to have you back. We we'll need to make sure. <laughs> well, because I think a lot of times like people don't know where to begin. And, and to your point, right. they might turn to their priest and say, hey, Father, uh, can you help me? My, my daughter says she's, she's trans now, and I don't even know what that means. Or, That's right. You know, right. Uh, our neighbor's son is getting married to another man. They want us to attend the wedding. Like what? Right. That's exactly right. Yep. So these are real issues. And, and oftentimes, because it appears the church doesn't have an answer or the church's answers are placed within a context of hate, uh, which, which is not who we are. Right. Then people think, well, why would I, to your point, Lisa, why would I be a part of that church? Right. Right. So I think that having our own answers ready um, and explain them. And, and I think this goes back to that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Like, you know, there is a lot in our faith, like the way of the Lord Jesus is first about him knowing Christ and then allowing his way uh, to, to kind of flow from that relationship. Uh, as one Protestant minister said to me uh, and asked me never to quote him um, because he has some relative following. But he said to me, um, you know, you Catholics, you get our best and we get your worst. Right. Because the people who leave the church, they go to these mega churches or these Protestant communities, yeah. and they're liberal. Like th these aren't biblical teachings, and right. the Protestant communities either accommodate the really liberal ones, right, or they try to further disciple the person to understand biblical truth and and, and sound morals and, and and you know just good teaching in terms of of all right. these different matters. And oftentimes the Protestant communities are like, man. Catholic church must be terrible. Like you haven't learned anything. Right. So they're constantly like having to like double teach. Right. Whereas on our part, when a Protestant becomes Catholic, like we get superstars <laughs> you know what I mean? because yep. they've believed and they've had to really work their way into leaving everything they've known in order to uh, become Catholic and, and further follow the, the, uh, the biblical truth. So uh, those are some quick answers in terms of pastoral and catechetical. So if you had my last question to you, it'll be, a, it'll be a tough one, I think. If you had 20, 25-year-olds in front of you right now, mm. and they all have left the church in the last few years, and basically are telling you, give us any good reasons to really come back, because we're just, we, this is what I hear all the time, we're spiritual, and the relationships between God and us has nothing to do with us going to a cute little church saying, you know, kneeling, standing, sitting, uh, you know, I've got a relationship with God, leave me alone. Mm -hmm. I, I would say to them that I have an answer, but before I propose an answer, I would want to hear about their relationship with God now uh, and take a posture of, of listening and just say, tell me what it means to be spiritual. Like, what, what are you doing now in your life uh, for me to understand that, right? Uh, and, and, and really just take a posture of asking a lot of questions and, and possibly getting to the point where I can propose an answer at the end or not. Uh, sometimes yeah. this is an ongoing process, but this younger generation, they want to talk. They want to be listened to. 
Yes. Uh, this is the generation that uh, has come from social media and the yep. digital world. And a lot of times, like, they are starving for attention to have someone actually ask a question and pay attention to them. I think yep. that's the first act of love we can give is, uh, tell me what that means. Like, and, and honestly, Lisa, sometimes I don't know what it means. Right? Right. <laughs> yeah. No, I love it. Listen. Yeah, try to listen. So that's right. what we parents can do more, right? Try to listen. I would encourage it. Yeah, and it could be hard when it's your own. I mean, because you raise them. Like, you say, come on, don't be stupid. <laughs> yeah, you know? but it's like, nope, suspend it, listen. Like, the, you yeah. know, uh, they now have their own narrative. They have their own experiences. And, and, and sometimes, like, we think we know. Like, if someone asks me that question, I have a very theological answer. Because theologically, I have, from our tradition, uh, clarification of these terms. But they might be using these terms in a very different way. And, and, and sometimes in a way that might not even make consistent sense. And so just asking so we can try to understand and then propose an answer. I love it, right? Seek to understand, then to be understood. Amen. Yes, yes. Amen. Very good. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Carolina Catholic Radio. And hopefully, I don't know if you have a copy of your book there. Can you share with us where to go to get it and, and um, how we can learn more about your journey? Yes, yes. So you can get it on Amazon or from the publisher, Our Sunday Visitor, uh, or from a local Catholic bookstore. And also my website, frkirby.com. Again, thank you so much and, and God bless. We appreciate it. And those of you that are listening, please join us again next Thursday at 5 p.m. for another um, Carolina Catholic Radio and Accountable um, Catholic. And thank you so much, Father Kirby, again. And we'll see you soon on another show here. <laughs>